at YouTube. So we're all set to go. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this monthly lecture meeting of Astronomy Ireland. Tonight, we're delighted to have James Bradley, who's going to talk about life in the universe. A very exciting talk. We're all looking forward to that. I'll tell you how to ask questions in a moment. Now, in the meantime, I'm David Moore, the founder of Astronomy Ireland and the editor of Astronomy Ireland magazine. Hopefully, uh, most of you probably are members. If you're not, you're more than welcome. And you're more than welcome to get our magazine. It's a popular level. I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. The format of our meetings, as always, we have a bit of the past, a big chunk of the present with our main speaker, and then a bit of the future. So at the end, we'll tell you about a couple of events coming up, evening classes, the biggest star party in Ireland, and very briefly, what to see in the sky. Most of it's in the magazine. But I'll just whet your appetite with a few of the main events. That's the future after our main talk. Uh, we, we always like to tell you what's been happening in, in astronomy in Ireland, in particular, since the last meeting. So just let me tell you a little bit about Astronomy Ireland first. We're over 30 years old now. We were going to have a big party last year and um, the pandemic came in the way and sort of scuppered that plan. But we hope to do something in the future. We were founded in 1990 and the club quickly became the most popular astronomy club in the world. A relative population, there's more people in the National Astronomy Society here than anywhere in the world, which is great to see. If you've ever been to my universe lecture, you'll know why, and I'll leave you to watch that at some future date. So what do we do in Astronomy Ireland? Well, we produce that monthly magazine every month, and that really is packed full of all the latest discoveries, linked in with any Irish angles to them. There's usually some researchers in Ireland that have been involved in most of the big stories. For instance, in December, we're going to have the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, part designed and built in Ireland. Would you believe more of that December issue? As well as these monthly talks, we have a, week, a weekly email that goes out to people reminding them of various events and what to see in the sky in case anything new has happened, uh, like, for instance, an aurora or indeed the International Space Station, which I'll tell you about after our main speaker. And of course, you have these monthly lectures, which if you miss them, you can get them for a while on Zoom and then permanently they're archived on DVD. So if you look back uh, on our website through all the DVDs, you'll see there have been lectures by everybody from the Astronomer Royal of Scotland uh, to the BBC's rock star astronomer, Professor Brian Cox, we've had before, loads more in between. So I'll tell you about some of those in a moment. The other thing we do, very appropriate to this meeting, is we have evening classes. They're now online, so everybody in the country can do them. In fact, we've broken records uh, with attendance to those in the last year, thanks to the pandemic and people looking for something to do. And in fact, the membership of the club has nearly doubled in one year, something we have never seen happen in our 30-year history. So go along to astronomy.ie, enroll in the evening classes. If you remember, you get a 50-year-old discount, and they've have now had thousands of people over the last two decades or more who've done those beginners classes on astronomy. Uh, they're starting the day after our next lecture in October. So watch out for those. I'll just remind you at the very end of the lecture again. We used to run lots of telescope watches, uh, setting telescopes up for the general public to come along and look through them. We haven't been able to do that for over a year, obviously. Uh, we're chomping at the bit in order to do them again. And as soon as we possibly can, we will lazy have maybe a month or two. Uh, we've still got the barbecue coming up, though. We'll tell you more about that at the end. In fact, the Starbecue is Ireland's biggest annual star party. It's a barbecue under the stars up in the Wicklow Mountains where the skies are jet black. We assemble giant telescopes and invite the general public to come along. It's a fundraiser for the club. So there's food included, talks, and then the night sky where you can see the Milky Way going down to the horizon. Definitely something to put on your bucket list. The date this year is October the 9th. Uh, we're trying to get a bigger a crowd than were allowed in the venue due to the restrictions at the moment. So any announcements on that will be made in due course on that member's email and indeed on our social media. We do talks in schools as well. We have a huge media presence, probably about 500 radio, TV, newspaper, now online interviews done every year. I was on the radio earlier today 
talking about this very lecture. Uh, and there's lots of exciting things happening in the weeks ahead, so I'm sure we'll be on again. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are pretty active. And they are great for alerting you to things like the Northern Lights, the Aurora, or when they're visible from Ireland, the International Space Station. Yeah, there are apps to tell you when that flies over. But we watch what's going on. If a craft is going up or coming down, we'll be able to tell you when there's a space chase and where you need to be in Ireland if the space station passes in front of the moon, which it probably will do in the next couple of weeks. So tune to our social media for all that. So a very busy club, as you can see. And our last meeting was uh, our August meeting on August 9th, when we were delighted to have Professor Andy Shearer give a fantastic talk. It was titled, What Will the Next Decade in Astronomy Bring? And there are huge jumps in telescopes, both in space and on the ground coming, like we've never seen in the past few decades. There's been an enormous revolution in technology to build not only extremely large telescopes, uh, much more so than in previous decades, but also to make the images ultra sharp with modern techniques. So it's like uh, I've seen the simulations, what they expect to see with these giant telescopes compared to the Hubble Space Telescope. And it makes the Hubble Space Telescope look like a pair of binoculars, which of course it isn't, which gives you some idea of the incredible discoveries we're going to have in this decade. So if you missed that talk, it's one of the ones I would highly recommend if you want to know what the next 10 years uh, it, it has in store. So go to astronomy.ie, look up the DVD section and order it. Uh, we've also had, at the, after the last lecture, the Perseid meteor shower, which is usually one of the best of the year. It was down a bit this year than in previous years, somewhat surprisingly. And we reckon it was only a half to two thirds of what we would normally expect. We're still analysing the results internationally. Uh, but there were cert certainly plenty around. It was one incredible fireball that lit up the entire country from Kerry to Donegal like daylight for a couple of seconds. I was pointing the wrong direction and I saw the ground light up in front of me. I thought I had a building behind me that was very low in the south. You'd think it exploded off the southwest coast of Ireland. But one of uh, our photographers was aiming his camera in the right direction at the right time and got an incredible photograph of it. That's in the in the magazine. Uh, so we've also had this nova in Cassiopeia that refuses to go away. It reached naked eye visibility at least twice and it's been uh, fading but now brightening again. We've been telling people about this in our weekly email. So to see a, an exploding star visible to naked eye, I've seen it with the naked eye, it's extremely rare. The last time I saw one of those was 1992. And we had the International Space Station in morning skies all last week and the week before. But the good news is this week it's coming into evening skies. So I'll tell you a little bit about that after our main speaker. It'll only be a few minutes of what to see in the sky, because as I said, it's all in the magazine. So hopefully I see a few people still getting admitted. Hopefully everybody's in and now we can start uh, the main business. So before I, I, I introduce our speaker, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box, but we're going to ask you to uh, ask your question verbally. So Sonia or Laura will call on you uh, to ask your question, but do please type it in so they'll, or at least the gist of it, so they can uh, order the questions and call on you to speak. By the way, if you're using Zoom on a laptop, the way I do, if you hold down the space bar, you can talk as long as you're holding down the space bar. If you're currently muted, it will unmute you. And when you let go of the space bar, it will remute you. That's probably the best way. Uh, so without any further ado, we are delighted to welcome James Bradley, who's been giving talks on all aspects of astronomy. Uh, he told me he has about 40 different talks that he gives. This one is, all, is going to be about life in the universe, a controversial and definitely exciting topic. Uh, but James has a degree in physics and astronomy and a master's. He's a member of the Institute of Physics as well and a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. So he's certainly qualified to speak on astronomical matters. But he also has a, he's going to be coming at this talk from a biological background as well. Uh, he uh, he uh, contributed to the peppered moth study under Dr. Kettlewell, uh, which is all about evolution. So we are delighted to have him give his talk all about life in the universe. Over to you, please, James. And thank you very much for agreeing to give the talk this evening. 
Thank you very much, David. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, pleasure to be here. <clears throat> my, where I am, I'm in the middle of nowhere, and my upload speed is simply pathetic. Um, and I see you're all extremely disciplined. So if you can keep your um, video off and mute yourselves, which I think is where you are, actually, that's very, very helpful because it will uh, help help me not to get um, slowed down by Zoom, which does happen. But um, there we are. Right, I will now bring up my slides. Right. I hope you should get the full screen picture now. She takes a second or two yep, to we have that. establish itself. Good, thank you. Right, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's a very difficult subject, this, um, and a very complicated one. Uh, this talk will run a tad over an hour, and I will touch upon various areas, really cherry picking things that I think are interesting aspects of the question, if you like. Uh, so let's see how we go. Uh, awful lot of people have opinions on this. The trouble is they're in other knowledge. So that's, that's really our problem. And one of the reasons is it, 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 there are too many disciplines involved, biochemistry, geology, astrophysics, and so on and so forth. People always ask astronomers, do you think there's life out there? And um, even the sort of famous ones say, oh, well, what I think is this. What they should say is, I haven't got the slightest clue because we haven't got, I haven't got the knowledge. But uh, for what it's worth, here's my view. But uh, they never put that caveat in, unfortunately. And so people make statements about it, which are basically gut feelings. And I've given talks on this or related talks uh, to a lot of different groups. And I ask people what they think. Um, and usually there's a fair number who feel that there are, um, there is life out there. Uh, and the main reason they seem to think that is that <clears throat> there are an awful lot of stars in the universe. Yes, there are an awful lot of grains of sand in the, on the beaches of the world as well. That doesn't make them alive, you know, but it, 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 it's a gut feeling which I think stems from, bl I blame Copernicus. Uh, once we weren't the centre of the universe, once the sun was the centre, and then the sun's a very ordinary star, uh, and it turns out it's in a very ordinary place in a fairly ordinary galaxy, and everything is so boring, it's just not worth talking about. And so we're probably very ordinary. Uh, well, by the time I finish this talk, I think you may feel differently, I hope. The other thing is... Um, we do need to look, whenever we look at anything, we find it's not what we expected. And I mean hot Jupiters. No one visualized hot Jupiters before we saw them. And then as soon as we see them, we can explain it. But the problem with the human race is we're too stupid to be able to anticipate things that aren't what we already know. You think that solar systems have to be like our solar system, and they're not. Um, and so we, we have to look, uh, and indeed we have been looking and we found an awful lot of stuff. So first of all, what is life? I like the definition that says uh, it's uh, something that can replicate, undergo Darwinian selection, and reduce local entropy. And that last term means increase local order, obviously at the expense of, of, of disorder elsewhere. But uh, that, I think, is the tightest definition I can make of what life is. And we'll, we'll, we'll press on with that. One of the problems we have is when we get to complex life, um, Hollywood's probably to blame. Uh, 
the, the aliens are almost invariably people like us, but distorted um, uh, anamorphoses of the human form with peculiar skinny bodies and big heads and whatever. No, probably not. And this cultural values thing that says there probably are out there, you see everywhere all the time. It's a very cultural thing rather than anything uh, rational. When pulsars were discovered, uh, one of the things that uh, they said was LGM, little green men, because this radio blip, 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 no one didn't know what it was. Uh, uh, I think it was Tommy Gold answered the question very quickly. Um, <clears throat> and it was a joke, actually. But the fact is, they thought it. They thought it, you know, that it could be aliens, even if they knew it wasn't. Another example is Tabby's star, the so-called WTF star, that is to say, where's the flux? And Tabby's star, the luminosity varies in a strange way. And people say, oh, perhaps there's an alien megastructure going around it. No, there isn't. There are dust clouds. Oumuamua, it's a funny shape, that object that came into the solar system. And it, it accelerated in a way that seems strange without leaving a, a tail. Uh, so it, it, perhaps it's a powered spacecraft. No, it's not. It's um, blowing nitrogen off, probably. You know, it, it, there's always a simple explanation, but people jump at the human thing or the alien thing. Uh, UFOs is, is a good example of that. And to some extent, SETI. Now, I'm all in favour of SETI. Uh, as I say, you have to look. But I've talked to a lot of people who've been involved in SETI, and although they're not sure they'll find anything, they really do believe there's something out there to be found, despite uh, what Fermi said, which is, well, if they're out there, where are they then? Uh, and that is the big question, because if you had a... a, 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 a capable technological species wanting to cover the whole galaxy, it could make self-replicating probes that would cover the whole galaxy in a few million years. And we've seen no sign of that. So there we go. Well, the famous Drake equation is where I'll start and it's more or less where I'll end. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, Frank Drake came up with it in the mid 1960s, they really couldn't attach numbers to any of these values. But we can now, so it'll be in, you'll see at the end where we get. So this is to try and figure out the number of people we might get in touch with. And that is these factors, rate of formation of stars multiplied by the proportion of those with planets, the proportion of Earth's planets like Earth, whatever that means, proportion of those that have life, proportion of those that have intelligence, proportion of those that have technology, multiply all those by the lifetime of a civilization, uh, and you have the number of civilizations out there. Now, um, yes, well, some of those terms we can get at quite easily, and some of them we can't, as you'll see by the time we get to the end of this talk. So we just look at the early stages of the development of, of, of the universe, what we need locally, We'll then go on and look at the stability question. Uh, and in particular, what has happened here to give you a feeling for how stability works, if you like. We'll digress from astronomy into some uh, biology and biochemistry for a little bit. Uh, and then we'll come back to the complex life question. One of our problems, and it's back to us, this business of being too stupid to think of anything else, when we talk about life, we, we have a sample of one. And so we tend to generalize from that, an extremely dangerous thing to do. Uh, so I will be trying not to do that, but if I do, um, you can, can bring me up on it later. So the early <coughs> universe had uh, no metals at all. That's to say elements heavier than hydrogen and helium to speak of, that is to say. <coughs> and uh, we did get galaxy formation really quite early by about uh, five, 600 million years after the Big Bang. And a lot of stars 
Uh, and these stars are the source of the metals shedding the elements they make in the nuclear process of these stars. So we're looking at needing to have quite a lot of stellar processes before we can make the elements that life is going to be made of. And the sun, where we are, it's in the suburbs of the Milky Way. And that's a good place to be in the thin disk, as it's called. If you're in the halo, that's pretty metal core. So that's not such a good, such good news. If you're in the core, that's also not such good news, not only because it's metal poor, poor because there's a, but also because there's a lot of stars very close by and uh, supernovae going off and all the rest of it. So it's a fairly un unpleasant place to be. So you want to be in the suburbs and you don't want to be too much above or below the plane of the galaxy because there's not a lot of metals there. So being in the thin disk, just the ticket really, and so population one stars, that is to say stars like the sun, so-called population one because the sun-like stars are the first we, we analyzed, uh, are the ones with lots of metals and that's what we want. So there's a galactic habitable zone is what it boils down to. Um, <clears throat> and we want metallicity, we don't want too little, which is what I've already talked about, but we don't want too much either. Um, I'll cover why that's so later, but we want to have something like um, the sun's metallicity, uh, which is 2% when it formed, plus or minus a factor of two, but that's wild guess. So if we take the star formation rate, which is one to 10 in the Milky Way, and then cut that down to all the places we don't want to be, uh, we can say the first term of the Drake equation is something like 0 0.1. <coughs> Having said that, it's never as simple as that. So I'll just put a caveat in here. Everything I say, you can challenge. And that's how science works. People often give talks and say, it's like this, and it's like this, it's like this. No, it never is. There's always some other complexity. So just to, to say, don't take all the things I've said as, oh, yes, it needs to be like that. Hmm, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So the distribution of these elements comes from two uh, principal sources, uh, <clears throat> red giants that go through thermal pulses in the nuclear processes inside them that puff off outer layers. That can be an enormous proportion of, of their mass, uh, mostly lighter elements, but some heavier ones as well. Uh, and supernovae, which, which of course explode, and they make lots of heavy elements, a lot of the heavier elements, uh, and also they send out shock waves that cause dust clouds to condense to make the next stars, so they're jolly useful. And people usually say all the heavier elements are made in supernovae, but it's not true. Um, when I say up to oxygen with red giants, actually, that's probably a bit unkind. They do make quite a lot of, or can make quite a lot of uh, heavier elements through a process called the S process, all the way up to um, uh, bismuth, which is a very heavy element, but unlikely. And <clears throat> so there are about 50-50 probably red giants and supernovae for making the sort of elements we're interested in. The only other source which becomes slightly fashionable to talk about now is colliding neutron stars, because you get a huge neutron flux, which is what you need to make gold and some other elements. Uh, so it's not with this ring I.V. wed, it's with this remnant of two colliding neutron stars I.V. wed. And that seemed to be clear. You can explain all the gold in the universe from that, but it more recently, um, a special sort of supernova called a collapsar seems to be able to do something similar. So the jury is always out. And that's why I say don't take anything as it's like this, because science is never a finished story. Now, uh, I said the plus or minus the sun's um, uh, metallicity. Uh, when there's more and more uh, heavy metals about, 
uh, particularly a type 1a supernovae, a particular sort of supernova, um, it, it pushes out an awful lot of iron. And that makes an awful lot of denser material in your dust from which to make planets. And that's not good news because you want a, a, a fairly lighter crust uh, to be able to do plate tectonics. You don't want one that's so dense that it's just sitting there and just not budging. Um, the question of the development of our lighter crust as opposed to a heavier one is another, another topic. <coughs> Moving on to some of the chemical animals. Giant molecular clouds have all sorts of um, ooh, quite interesting uh, compounds in them. You know, one cloud near the galactic center has got a huge amount of ethanol in it, which I've been told is perhaps the reason we were put in the universe. We need to do something with it. Well, sugars, yes, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are basically poisonous gunge, buckyballs, carbon-60 molecules, they've all been detected, and quite a lot of amino acids. When they discovered glycine on 67P, Churium of Gerasimenko, which nobody can pronounce or remember, perhaps. Um, they got terribly excited, but it is actually the simplest amino acid. And as you can see, it's a very simple molecule. Therefore, um, they said, oh, it's a precursor of life. Not really, it's not. Um, solar system, tholins, all sorts of molecules comets, dust grains, etc., um, all covered in this gunge, which, which is created from uh, solar radiation on nitrogen, ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, water, and so on and so forth. So we see a lot of, a lot of organic goo, prebiotic chemistry, if you like, but it is a very high radiation environment, and that's not good um, because it breaks up l large molecules. So we've got a lot of molecules, but uh, not very big ones. <coughs> stars. Stars are born in embedded clusters, almost always. Uh, and that means they're born all together, very close together, like here in the um, Orion Nebula. You get a lot of stars close together, which is why we get so many multiple star systems. They do then disperse, we get open clusters all over the place, which themselves evaporate eventually. But we do get a lot of uh, binary and, and more systems, uh, and they're probably not quite so good as single stars for what we want. The reasons, I guess, are fairly obvious. <clears throat> if you're in Star Wars on Tatooine, you've got two stars there. Uh, and if, if, you're, if they're close together and you're orbiting the two of them, that's possible. But if they've got different spectral classes, then they're likely to the amount of insulation, the amount of radiation you receive from them will vary enormously as they go around each other. And so that, that's perhaps not altogether good news. The S-type, where they're orbiting one star, a very wide binary, is much more um, gravitationally unstable three-body problem, although we have found some. Uh, Kepler-47 uh, has got a nice P-type system with several planets. So we are surprised to find that they would that they exist because we didn't think it would be so. So it's interesting. There's another possibility, the so-called Trojan situation, extremely unlikely. And in fact, you don't sit at exactly the Trojan point, the L4 or L5 points. That triangle, you, you describe a path round other as time goes on. And for that to work at all, one star has to be uh, nearly 25 times as massive as the other one. So this is not a nice place to be, probably. Anyway, what we need then is appropriate metallicity. 
we don't want blue giants that are going to blast us to pieces in any way, blow the dust and gas away from the forming planetary system. We do think planets need to form around stars. We don't need multiple star systems, probably. We need to have be in the circumstellar habitable zone. Uh, and that has generally been taken to mean where we get liquid water on the surface and probably not the moons of hot Jupiters. It's been suggested that a Jupiter with big moons moving towards the star could be a, a good place. Well, we'll mention that in a bit, bit later. And what have we found? Basically, stars have planets. That's what it boils down to. Um, and uh, Kepler and Tess are, are showing that certainly at least 50% seem to have planets. Uh, and Alma has lovely pictures in the infrared of uh, are undoubtedly planets forming. Uh, and uh, so they just do seem to be everywhere. So planets are very common around um, forming stars. What size are they? Well, <clears throat> this is comparing the, the solar system with, with others. And uh, we don't have the two gray bars, uh, but we do have mostly the other sizes. And inevitably, the smaller the planet is, the more likely it is to, to exist. So there should be lots and lots and lots of planets that are Earth-ish sizes, is what it boils down to. And here's one everybody got very excited about, a Kepler 186. F uh, in the so-called habitable zone, which NASA very kindly as a green. Uh, I think they're a bit optimistic because when I worked out uh, the insulation, the energy it would have received from this M1 class star, it's something like half what. Uh, um, or Mars gets, so I, I think I think they're a bit uh, enthusiastic, thinking it is in the habitable zone. But a few dozen have been found. Um, this one looked more hopeful. Uh, its uh, flux is more than Mars it's receiving. Uh, its mass is nearer to Earth, so that's quite a good one. So we are finding them. The uh, Trappist-1 stipped systems of tightly packed pla inner planets they look like that could be quite a common phenomenon. They have to be in certain resonances. Because it's a very dim class M star. And uh, it's possible uh, the stars <coughs> will cause these planets all to have captured rotation. Uh, and that uh, makes it a bit difficult. Uh, but if they've got uh, liquid water on them, oceans or something, that acts as a great buffer and can carry, and an atmosphere, it can carry energy around the planet, even if it's tidally locked. You do need to have an appropriate mix of some of the elements, and I'll mention this one in particular. The carbon-oxygen ratio needs to be <clears throat> certainly not more than 0.8. Um, because the problem is uh, you end up with a pretty noxious planet with an atmosphere of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and a lot of carbon smog, and a, and a carbon gungy, tholinish surface. So you don't want too much carbon uh, in the planet. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. The... Um, um, planet around 55 Cancri looks like an example of this. But what we want is something more that's in the crust, uh, and rather than this uh, carbon planet with all stuff that uh, isn't really that nice, we we want a, we want a nice mixture of elements that can react together. So the habitable zone. Um, as the mass of the star gets greater, it's brighter and it's further from the star. Uh, and although this particular chart shows the 
uh, the radius going outwards, so that this is obviously getting wider and wider, the habitable zone as you go out, it's not doing it nearly enough because stars get much, much brighter as they get more massive. Uh, and um, so, but you get the idea, the more bright the star, the further from it the habitable zone is going to be. And for some reason that eludes me, we all select the habitable zone as being somewhere between the equivalent of uh, Venus and Mars. So let's have a look at that a bit. If we look, uh, say Proxima Centauri, we're looking at a lifetime that's enormous. And you have with the sun, for example, problems with flares. Certainly the planets will be tidally locked and it will also erode the tilt, so you won't get seasonal stuff. But a recent paper published only a couple of weeks ago, actually, showed that a lot of these flares on these class M stars tend to come out through the poles. And if that's the case, the planets might not get their atmospheres blasted off them. But that's uh, still subject to research, I should say. The sun doesn't look bad. Lifetime 10 billion years. We're halfway through that. Uh, and there we are in the habitable zone. <clears throat> might be better to be a class K star because it's stable for a lot longer than a class uh, G star. But uh, yeah, well, that's an opinion. You have them to get much brighter and you're starting to get short of lifetime, times the mass of the sun, but uh, it's, it's not only much brighter and lifetime shorter, but its luminosity changes faster as the nuclear reactions inside run faster. So it's uh, not a very stable situation. What happens is the, the sun, as it's going through uh, its nuclear processes, it's getting a core that's getting more and more full of helium, it's greater and greater, so the hydrogen in it burns faster, approximately half percent um, brighter every 100 million years. So it's about 20 or 25 percent brighter than it was when it started. And so what greenhouse gases do you need? Earth's temperature is controlled and has been for a while largely by carbon dioxide. If we didn't have any greenhouse gases, the Earth's temperature would be about 18 degrees Celsius cooler than it is. But um, in a few hundred million years, two or three, three or four hundred million years, um, we will want no greenhouse gas at all. And after that, it will get hotter. And in a billion years time, the oceans will have boiled away and the whole place will be dead, basically. So when people say we're halfway through the Earth's life or the sun's life, absolute rubbish. We're only just at the very end of the, the time that's appropriate. Uh, and so we've got uh, a couple of hundred meters to move further away or terraform Mars or something. So much time, basically. So this applies to all class K stars. It doesn't apply to class M stars. And it, as I said, this, this, this increase in brightness uh, is faster, the brighter stars are. So the sun's about as big a star as you want, is I guess what I'm saying. So given what I've said, um, this isn't to scale, it's just an idea. If the sun's much brighter than it was when it started, and we're getting near at the bottom, the inner edge of the habitable zone, uh, why, four billion years ago, do we think Mars looked possible for life when it would have been out, well outside the habitable zone. And the answer is the habitable zone is not a fixed place. It's a very it um, depends on, on greenhouse gases, on a whole bunch of stuff. And so we think it's it is possible. So when we talk about the habitable zone, it's not really a fixed place. 
Eccentricity is another problem that troubles us. You don't want to be too eccentric. Uh, when I say if the oceans annually boiled and froze, un un unlikely actually, because oceans act as a very good buffer. Uh, but uh, so there's a quite reasonable eccentricity, a lot more than we have, is I'm sure quite tolerable by life, particularly if it's in the oceans. We mentioned the three body problem that can throw bodies around. Uh, and that's true with multiple planets, apart from having two stars or whatever. So overall, then, perhaps only one star in 20 uh, in the Milky Way, or one, one twentieth of the volume of the Milky Way is, is appropriate. Oh, I seem to have stopped there. Right, what about the moon? Uh, let me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the moon making collision. This is the most popular theory. There are a lot more theories. A very low velocity collision. Probably, if Thea is the right theory, it would have been at one of the Lagrange points and just drifted off station. Mars size object bashing into the Earth, and the Earth is about two thirds of its present size very slowly. That way the material stayed around where it was and uh, was able to form the moon. And there are a number of twists to this theory, if you like. If there wasn't a collision, we'd have more crust and mantle on the earth. The water and the atmosphere came later, so that they're not really part of the argument. One of the things people often talk about is oceanic tides. Um, yes, but actually um, that's only relevant to the complex life that's uh, been using that the middle range in the last 500 million years or so. Um, people say it's stable. And yes, it has or does, but it only just does if the moon was very slightly bigger or very a bit closer to us it would actually be destabilizing. And it's only in the last one and a half billion years that it has been a stabilizing influence. However, there are various theories that uh, perhaps uh, the closeness of the moon in its early years could have flexed the Earth's crust, helping it to stay warm when it, because the sun was weaker, it wasn't very warm. Um, so perhaps that uh, helped keep the Earth at a, a nice temperature. Um, well, it's 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 a, it's a theory. The stability of the axial tilt. People talk about well, Mars hasn't got a moon; it's all over the place. Well, <clears throat> I have to say Mars is all over the place because of where it is, and that has a lot to do with Jupiter and the forces um, coming from Jupiter. If the Earth didn't have the moon. Yes, it would have more variation in its axial tilt, but it wouldn't go absolutely potty like, like it's not as bad as you might think. <clears throat> Another important consideration for the moon is that the combination of the moon and the earth may have provided a magnetic field that protected the Earth's atmosphere from being blown off from active flares from the early sun. Um, well, yeah, possibly, um, possibly. But uh, again, it, it's, it's another theory. So maybe the moon was important. Maybe not. Well, we want stability. And what I'll do is just run through a little bit of the history of what we think happened, for example, of one, which is a pretty pathetic uh, line of reasoning, but uh, it does tell you something about the sort of things that can happen. So the initial formation of the planets, the heavy bombardment, um, and what gas giants do, uh, what the theories say, some, some people say several gas giants is great because their gravity sweeps up the debris so that we haven't got big bodies to smash into the earth, as we saw with Shoemaker-Levy. However, uh, several gas giants does throw bodies about as well. And so it's a bit uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other, um, whether, you, whether it's good news. 
So we have the thing called the Grand Tack, uh, <clears throat> which I think is rather elegant theory that Jupiter starts uh, here about three and a half times the distance of the Earth to the Sun. And like hot Jupiters, it comes moseying in towards the Sun to about Mars's orbit. Saturn starts here and it grows more quickly and then gets a resonance, uh, which is difficult to get the circumstances just right to do that. But uh, I think it's a very elegant idea. And it accounts for several things in the solar system. Here's the same thing <clears throat> in another format. Um, if we've got um, the Earth distance from the sun here, but all we've got here is rocky things and planetesimals. And as Jupiter moves in to um, Mars's position, it's going to throw the whole lot about and destroy any stuff that was existing uh, in the inner solar system. And the second picture here shows Saturn coming in and everything being thrown everywhere. So that's matter of the solar system. And here they are just getting into their resonance with the scale that's doubled up here. And the blue bits are icy, so they'll be on the ice line. And then <clears throat> Jupiter and Saturn move out. And as they do so, they disrupt all this icy stuff. So we end up with some icy stuff in here in the asteroids, uh, or indeed uh, on the Earth, come to that. Uh, and a lot of rocky stuff in the outer solar system. It's a complete mixture of everything everywhere. And it's only at this point that the inner planets can form. Having got out to more or less where they are, <clears throat> there's then a question of what happens with the other planets, the ice giants, because uh, we think they formed a lot closer to the star than they are now, or they wouldn't have had time to form properly. And it looks like the resonance with uh, Jupiter uh, and Saturn caused Uranus and Neptune to be pushed about. And Neptune was probably the inner planet, became the outer one. There's probably another planet, at least one more, that's got thrown out of the system. And all of this proto-Kuiper belt outside of Uranus orbit, again, is thrown all over the place. And people thought this was perhaps the late heavy bombardment it doesn't seem to tie in with a lot of the major collisions in the solar system. Uh, however, having said that, of course, an awful lot of gobbins would be floating around for a, uh, quite a long time before it actually did collide. So that's a bit of a moot point. So the grand attack, as it's sometimes called, uh, and the follow on from that, looks as if it uh, has really cleared out a lot of uh, rubbish. Uh, <clears throat> whereas if it hadn't have happened, you'd still have all this stuff around. And where are we now? So every few years we get a Chelyabinsk type thing. Every century or so, something like the Tunguska event, also in Siberia. Every few hundred million years, we get a Chikhulub 10 kilometer job hitting the earth. Uh, and <clears throat> we've got a sort of even chance of having had a 100 kilometre impact in the last four billion years, which would surely uh, sterilise the planet. So we're on the cusp of having cleared enough stuff up, I should say, to be comfortably stable. So we need to, a, a lot of that stuff needs to be cleared up. Here's a nice picture of the Tunguska event. Uh, probably a comet exploded uh, over Siberia. If it happened over London, everything with the M25 orbital motorway would be down to sort of two bricks or something, which um, a lot of people think might be a good idea. Uh, but there we go. So moving on to biology, uh, life appeared very, very quickly once it could, which implies it's either easy to start de novo, or spontaneously, or the panspermia theory is right. Panspermia doesn't really help because you just move the problem to somewhere else. So the question is, how can life start? And we'll look at that a bit. We do think it's likely to be have to be carbon. 
Um, there are other theories, but um, it, it's, it's way ahead of, of the others. And the question is, what do you record your genetic information on? We haven't found anything that works quite so well as DNA. <coughs> For example, RNA is uh, prone to too many errors. You have to have something that selective processes can work on. You have to have mutation, but not too much mutation. And so the amount of mutation is selected for in, the, if you like, the design of the molecule. It's really a, quite a complicated question. And the nucleic acids, the way DNA has them, the nucleotides, they're, they're not necessarily the ones you have to have. People have made artificial ones that work just as well. So, uh, but something of that sort, it's a very simple molecule that repeats, you know, a lot of times. Uh, and uh, so something like that is what we need to have. And yes, we do want liquid water. Water is very special. Uh, and uh, probably needs to be water as a solvent. So how about where life can develop? <clears throat> we know a lot about the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, and so on, water. Well, where did the water come from? Well, that's another problem, which uh, <clears throat> probably from asteroids. Comets was a theory, but uh, that's rather um, going out of the window. Uh, the Miller and Urey experiment put all this atmosphere into a flask and run sparks through it to make lightning and produce a lot of amino acids and got very excited about that, which is fine. Uh, and indeed, there will have been a snow of organic molecules falling onto the earth, no doubt. Bailey was looking for sugars and he found them doing the same way. So um, there's, there's a lot of stuff. But the problem is you have to concentrate them for this to work. You can't just have them floating in the ocean. So where can we do it? Darwin thought about a pond, you know, somewhere. Not so good. You're, you're, you're not concentrating things. Um, the crust, well, it's an ocean world, really, to start with. Uh, and <clears throat> on ice, well, maybe, but it's a cold place. And there aren't the minerals there, really, which is why the theory that it could have happened on clays was proposed, because you have got all the minerals. Um, but you can't, in my opinion, concentrate them enough to, to make that work. But yeah, it's, 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 it's quite popular in some quarters. Impact craters have been suggested. You've got hydrothermal springs with a lot of different minerals and a nice temperature for quite a long time. Deeper in the crust, it's one the theory, I think that's probably been thrown out. But the deep oceans is, is probably the best bet. And that arose because of black smokers, uh, although they're probably not the place. Alkaline vents, yes. Um, black smokers are too hot. That's basically the problem. They produce a lot of nice um, organic compounds, um, but they're not going to produce anything very complex, uh, and they're not concentrating material in a way that we might uh, need. And people say, oh, well, we've got uh, organisms that uh, metabolize sulfur. So, uh, you know, we're looking very primitive here, aren't we? No, we're not. Um, it's hydrogen sulfide reacting with oxygen. There's got to be oxygen in the water for them, and there wasn't. So the appearance of these hydrogen the sulfur um, metabolizing. Anyway, they do produce a lot of good stuff that we want, um, but if we go to the alkaline vents, uh, the great thing about them is they're a nice temperature, uh, <coughs> and they are full of pores, micro pores. That's terribly important because that's how you can concentrate materials. Olivine is the rock in question, and you get alkaline fluids inside this. Um, olivine reacts with water to form serpentinite. And this little. Um, Time to get concentrated, got all the minerals we want, uh, and it's a situation where we can do a lot of carbon fixation by reduction of CO2. That's a very difficult thing to do, doing it in the lab quite difficult. And the other thing uh, we can say about it is because of the pH gradients between the acid 
ocean and the alkaline uh, rock, uh, <clears throat> we've got uh, at the interface electrical gradients of the order of 30 megavolts per meter. And that's pretty much the electric potential you find across the membranes in our cells. So it's, it's all very, very suspicious, very suggestive, if I can put it that way. So olivine is a very simple mineral. It's magnesium or iron silicate. And we find it everywhere. It, it's, you know, it's really everywhere. So is water, so is carbon dioxide. And the great thing about olivine reacts with water to produce a pentonite uh, and all these micropores and also produces, one of the reactions can produce hydrogen, which is something we want to make as well so that we can get reactions like this going. You've got a vent full of hydrogen, which is very alkaline. You've got an ocean full of carbon dioxide or carbonic acid. At the interface, we combine those things and start making large quantities of organic molecules uh, possible. <clears throat> well, the pores concentrate them. We've got the energy. It's, it's like a battery, if you like. Explains our membrane gradients for, for the, the, the um, megavolts per meter, which is actually only tiny because the membranes are very small. And uh, the theory is we became dependent on this energy uh, from the potential gradient developed a lot of equipment that used it, and that's what we're still doing. So this, this theory looks good. And here's the last universal answer that would have been in one of these micropores here. The um, Luca, the last universal common ancestor, uh, it's an interesting one because the archaea and the bacteria have completely different membrane systems. So either LUCA preceded the development of membranes and just existed as something free inside these pores, or there is no LUCA. That is to say, archaea started in one place and bacteria in another. So we don't know. We don't know. Complex life didn't appear until about two billion years ago. And it is very, very much um, more complex internally, the cells. Uh, <clears throat> and not much happened until there was an oxygen-rich atmosphere. It was just mostly single-celled stuff until recently, until seven or 600 million years ago. And what we particularly have in complex cells is mitochondria. The eukaryotes are particularly have a lot of internal structure to their cells, <clears throat> cytoskeleton, chloroplasts, for example, um, but so much DNA, very vulnerable to radiation, and potassium-40, there was a lot of it, uh, uh, and the early crust would have been pretty radioactive. Again, a reason to be in the oceans, really. And we're all related. Something like 30% of the genes in a carrot are, are in us. So there we go. And we're more related than that even. I mentioned mitochondria because that is the key. The absorption or endosymbiosis of one bacterium by an archaean uh, has made uh, the the carrots have and mitochondria in all the complex things that complex uh, life can do. Uh, the endosymbiosis is not that strange a thing. Chloroplast is another example of it. Um, but the point about mitochondria is it gives us the energy we need, firstly. And secondly, it seems we're all descended from one. It happened once in the whole history of the planet. This one bug absorbing another one happened once. And so we are all got related mitochondria. All animals, all complex plants, we're all related through one event. Uh, and 
in biology, things that can happen happen more than once if they can. So a thing that only happened once is just got to be really unlikely. Of course, it may have happened more than once and we ate the others, but uh, anyway, it's going to be very rare. Another thing that keeps the planet uh, habitable, if you like, is getting rid of all that carbon dioxide and light of that. It takes the carbon dioxide, like the White Cliffs of Dover or whatever, and uh, that eventually goes down into the underneath the crust through plate tectonics and comes out in volcanoes geologic processes so there's a sort of 500 million year cycle there but uh, an awful lot of the carbon dioxide is locked up and that that makes the thing sort of work for life I suppose if you like. It's a fussy slide this but I'll just draw your attention to one or two things. I mean, there was a <clears throat> um, supercontinent called Kennerland here that broke up and as it broke up, a lot of things happened, including the first uh, oxidation. Uh, and the first time there was a lot of free oxygen in the atmosphere. When I say a lot, it's still very much less than we have today. We could live there now. Uh, and it's um, a result of the breakup of the supercontinent. So it's part of plate tectonics, really, that that happened. Then another supercontinent formed, and where when Rodinia broke up, exactly the same thing happened. And on both occasions, huge surge in the amount of oxygen, huge consumption of carbon dioxide, huge reduction in greenhouse gases, and snowball earths. So that's all rather sad, really. Sort of, sort of not not good for them, really. The importance of uh, plate tectonics becomes evident with snowball earths because uh, <clears throat> when you've taken out all the greenhouse gases, the ice, the ice starts at the poles that reflects more of the sun's heat and off it goes towards the equator as more and more of the and you get a positive feedback effect until the place is frozen up. Plate tectonics makes uh, carbon dioxide come out of volcanoes and it doesn't get rained out of the atmosphere because there's no rain and eventually there's enough that the uh, there's enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the greenhouse gas effect to start melting the equator and you get a positive feedback effect the other way the whole thing melts very quickly uh, as the darker oceans absorb more heat than the ice. And the whole surface of the Earth probably changes from something like minus 50 Celsius to plus 50 Celsius in something of the order of 10 to 100 years. You wouldn't want to be there. So we're still talking about things that will be deep in the ocean. And it's another reason why water is important, because frozen water floats other solid um, forms of, of elements sink, they're heavier than the liquid, so the fact that water floats means stuff was quite happy underneath it. And then, of course, since then, we've had a lot of complex life, and it's so successful, we haven't got a clue how else you could do it. It's what, lots of mass extinctions, a lot of nasty things happen all the time uh, on our planet, the end Cretaceous, the Cretaceous Paleogene, last one, the, uh, this one, uh, that's the smallest of the five, the one caused by the Chicola uh, collision. End Triassic, we think that's possibly a collision. The end Permian was probably a geologic thing of outgassing, uh, but we don't know. We don't know for sure. Uh, in fact, the Permian one may have been a double whammy, we think. But um, it's it, it, took a photo that destroyed the dinosaurs. That was very fortunate. And through the atmosphere is a bit wrong because an object that size doesn't go through the atmosphere. It it just compresses it. And it's thought that a lot of the problem may have been the amount of sulfur dioxide coming out from the Deccan traps. A huge amount of basalt come erupting out in, in India. 
<clears throat> and the other side of the world. So perhaps a shockwave traveled around the world and they all met again and, uh, and caused this to happen. Uh, they're called traps, by the way, because if you see they're layered here, and uh, traps is actually comes from the Swedish trappa, meaning steps, that's all it is. But actually, the Deccan traps, if you wind the clock back, wasn't at the antipodes from Chikolub, so it doesn't really work. And in addition, it, it turns out that it was actually for a period before the impact. Um, it may well have weakened species a bit so that the impact did more damage, but really, it's the impact that did the damage. <coughs> Come on. Okay, uh, just a quick run through of uh, the time of the Earth, a 12 hour clock. The Earth forms just before two o'clock, you have the late bombardment, if indeed there was one. Um, half past two, first sign of life, not a lot happening until the first sign of complex life, four hours later. We've got this thing called the boring billion, where nothing much geological or biological happened. Uh, in that period, uh, although complex life uh, did get cracking a bit, sex was invented somewhere in that period, so perhaps it's not too boring. And then it all started happening when oxygen reached 15%. Uh, it's not until 11 o'clock that the first plants got onto land. Uh, 11 minutes from midnight or whatever, the dinosaurs appeared, and we appeared a third of a second before. And another hour and a half or something, that'll be the lot. So we only just got here in time, as you can see. So other people have suggested other places, uh, possible, possible, uh, heated by uh, tidal factors. Europa has, has an ocean underneath the icy crust, pretty salty, but it's possible. Enceladus is another one. <clears throat> the Cassini probe picked up water and some rocky things, but it, it couldn't analyze what it was. There's some minerals that picked up as well. So there might well be something going on under there. Worth looking at, I suggest. <clears throat> Moons of hottish Jupiters, probably not. You can think of Jupiter as being like a mini solar system with its, really, it's further out. And the um, problem is the first moons that form interact with the dusty uh, disk and do the equivalent of the hot Jupiter trick of falling onto the planet. And it's only when you've got a small enough amount of dust left uh, that the planets, or that the moons, I mean, uh, don't uh, have any interference that you can do it. And as you see from these numbers, Ganymede's mass is tiny, far too small to be useful as a planet. So it's still, still under discussion that point. So coming back to our friend, the Drake equation, uh, <clears throat> our star where we know is point one from what we saw, the, the proportion of planets, it's a lot, certainly 50%, 0.5. How many Earths uh, per of those planets, 1% maybe, if we look at the left-hand column. If you've got an Earth, I suggest uh, life arose here very quickly. So if you've got an Earth, that means it's am am amenable to life. And so life happens quickly. How, how likely intelligent life is to arise, that's the rub, I think, or one of the rubs. Uh, and we have to guess how likely that is. Uh, and then if you've got intelligent life, well, we went from, let's say, um, modern man 50, 70,000 years ago to where we're to the moon uh, quite quickly. So I suggest that's quite likely. Uh, and it also depends, of course, how long a civilization can last, how long will ours last after all. And taking the numbers I've sort of rather arbitrarily plunged into the left-hand column, there's, there's one chance in 400 that there's another intelligent communicating civilization in the Milky Way. If we take things like the chance of intelligence and complex life developing in a way that uh, is, to my mind, more probable, in other words, it's, it, it, it's less likely to happen, those numbers are 
these numbers, 10 to the minus 6, seem to me to be better numbers, then we get really very little chance at all, uh, even if we extend the lifetime to a million years. So you can play with the numbers, but they don't look good, however you play with them, in my opinion. On the other hand, if we cut out the intelligence bit and just look at uh, simple life, uh, it looks like there's a jolly good chance, based on the numbers we had in the previous slide, that there'll be lots of simple life about. Very near the end now. Uh, must it be carbon-based? Yeah, we think so. Must it have water? Probably, although people are looking at the question of titans, methane, ethane lakes as could they be a solvent for life? doesn't have to be redox involved in carbon and oxygen, but it's got to do something, got to do something to get energy out somehow, um, reduction oxidation process of some sort, and it mustn't be something that's very reactive or it will run to equilibrium. We've got to manage the process. So what should we look for if we're looking for... Um, well, as we've seen, the constituents of various humans. So, just sort of looking for oxygen in particular, probably a waste of time. If you want to find exo life, James Lovelock in 1964 commented, look for an atmosphere that's in imbalance. And he was, he was with NASA and he told them they were wasting their time going to Mars because it hasn't got an atmosphere in imbalance. Which is why, of course, when methane was discovered on Mars, people got very excited. Um, and the same we may say for phosgene on Venus, although I have to say if that was produced by life, so would a lot of other compounds be that haven't been detected. And I think it hasn't been completely rejected yet, but a lot of people are challenging the uh, conclusion that, that, that the phosgene was found on Venus. Um, but, in, you know, the people who wrote that paper, they say, well, we didn't say there's definitely life here, but they did say in their paper this is not strong evidence for life. In other words, we think it's life. And that's not good science. You know, this business of always seeing life where uh, the chance is probably not. So look for things that are not in equilibrium. Uh, <clears throat> so not necessarily for oxygen. <clears throat> Interesting enough, you can make a planet oxygen rich without life at all, uh, simply by the um, radiation from the star breaking water down into hydrogen and hydroxyl radicals, combining them to make hydrogen peroxide from which you can make oxygen. And if you keep on doing that for billions of years, you may well get an oxygen atmosphere. Although if we look at Earth, the two places where the oxygen levels really shot up at the breakups of the two supercontinents, Kenoland and Rodinia, they were clearly a biological uh, oxygen production. Um, so it's possible, though, that during the so-called boring billion leading up to uh, eight, eight, 700 million years ago, uh, that non-biological production of oxygen may have, may have helped. <clears throat> Okay, nearly there. Got another slide or so. Mars, it's not big enough. You need a planet to be like 25% of the mass of the Earth to hold water vapor. Really? So that's a problem. Uh, you really want a magnetic field. Uh, and in connection with that, Earth's core is starting to freeze or has been for some time. And if it carries on as it, as it is, <clears throat> eventually uh, it will all freeze and we won't get a magnetic field or we won't have a magnetic field. That's after the oceans have all boiled, so don't worry about it. You need lots of rotation. So Venus is a bad one because it rotates very slowly. Uh, so there's all sorts of little factors that are quite important. You don't want it to be too massive um, because otherwise you have a very massive crust uh, and, and, and no plate tectonics. And you really need them, I think. And the more massive atmosphere, of course, means there's going to be more greenhouse gases, more gases altogether. 
And so the so-called circumstellar habitable zone is much further from the star for more massive planets. So you don't want the planets to be too small. You don't want them to be big, etc. So look for, look for oddies. One of the things that uh, chlorophyll does uh, <coughs> is it absorbs light, but it goes absolutely transparent in the infrared. Uh, and so if you're looking at the spectrum, you suddenly see this change in the absorption uh, if you're looking at a large mass of, of, of life, uh, <clears throat> like bacterial mats or something. Uh, and <clears throat> that's, that's, that's possible, yes, that's something strange. Uh, another particular thing you can look for is carbon isotopes not being what they should be. Carbon-12, it's very, very slightly easier to use for biological process and so it tends to be preferred. So if you see um, a lot more carbon-13 than should be there, then somebody's locked up the carbon-12 somewhere. Good example of life probably. So if you want to find complex life uh, and animals, maybe you should look for oxygen. But as I say, that is really insufficient. It has been suggested we should look for green colours, because that's plants. Well, that's because we have chlorophyll that works green. Um, for some reason, don't take, take, take the things, but green. If they were to be efficient, they would take the green. And then, they, then all the theory has it that perhaps there was uh, some uh, green absorbing bacterium like the uh, today's purple bacteria that uh, could have blocked this part of the spectrum so that they there was no natural selection to look to use green maybe so better look for black but then you know blacks everywhere we see organic goo that's all black everywhere uh, and also the idea that we should look for green is making assumptions about how plants are and that's what so I think wrong about a lot of exobiology things. They're really arguing from the, the example of, of, of the uh, earth. So to finish, it looks like starting life doesn't look a too big a problem. It does look like long-term stability is difficult to get. If you want to find life, look for something wrong with the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, simple life, a lot of it, complex. So I think that's where I get to. Um, however, um, John Gifford has very kindly taken a picture proving that everything I've said is completely wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. That was a phenomenal treatise on all the aspects <laughs> of the universe that lead to life, at least simple life. Uh, there are a few questions, and I think Laura is going to uh, collate them and ask the speakers to come online, uh, unmute themselves, or just hold down the space bar like I am, and ask their question that way. That correct, Laura? Yeah, that's I can do that now, yeah. So who are you going to ask first? Uh, so the first question is from Tom Finnegan, if Tom would like to unmute. Hello, James. Uh, I want to ask, is the Drake equation really of any value if we know so little? We're at the, the start of finding out if there is any other life of any kind, let alone whether it is intelligent or not. Yeah, well, Tom, you make a, a very good point, I might say. There are plenty of people who say it's a complete waste of space. And I suppose the main reason I've used it is because it is very popularly used. But I think by fiddling with the terms in it, you can see where the weaknesses are. And the greatest weakness is 
uh, in getting from life to intelligent life. That you could break down into a, a dozen different steps, each of which has a difficult likelihood, I think. So I think it is a starting point, and I used it because it's widely used. I, um, well, I, yes, you have a point, I think, uh, Tom. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, uh, I know it's, it's limited in what it can do, indeed. Next question is from Laura Quigley, if you would like to unmute Laura. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, um, we can hear. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask if there was a planet similar to Earth, uh, like with a civilization like uh, humanity on it uh, in a nearby star, could we detect it with our current technology? Not easily with today's technology, but with the sort of telescopes we'll have over the next decade or so, if it's not too far away, yes. Um, they say that uh, the first sign of life on Earth is the methane in an oxygen atmosphere. So the, the, the first sign of life is the um, farting of herbivores and termites and things. That's indicative of life, really. So it's, um, the answer is yes. Uh, you, 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 you will be able to see a planet with uh, atmospheric instabilities. And uh, that's indeed what uh, we're finding with Mars and the methane and Venus with the phosphine. Um, although, of course, we're very close, but we will be able to uh, make those assessments. Uh, alas, not going very far, but uh, in, 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 in nearby stars where we really can analyze the atmospheres of, of the planets. Thank you. Okay, next question is from Ed Malarkey, and I'm going to ask it as he has no mic. Even if we find alien life, we will we ever interact with it as it could be too far away, I think is what he's asking. Yes, I agree with that. Um, the distances are, are really horrendous, and uh, uh, I, I think he's right. <laughs> and he also asks have all ufo sightings been rationally explained no they haven't and that's why they're unidentified flying objects um i think though i would come back to the statement if you're going to make uh, uh an extreme claim that it's aliens or whatever you need extreme evidence and we don't have that. Uh, we just have people's opinions. An awful lot of UFOs have been explained rationally. Um, and that, interestingly enough, doesn't convince any of the people who think it hasn't been explained. So there's a certain uh, cultural problem here as well. And when we say, has it been explained? Uh, yes, but uh, we certainly have no we have no evidence that there really is anything uh, out there, uh, as best we know, as best we know. Um, Anne Dunn asks the next question, Anne, if you would like to unmute. Sorry, <laughs> took me a while to sort that one out. Um, yeah, fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. Really good. But I was just wondering, like, how soon after the Big Bang could life have formed? As you were saying about it, it needs stability to be established. So, you know, clearing all the area and also then. So could civilizations have come and gone and elsewhere in the universe before this? Well, they're good questions. These. Um... How soon after the Big Bang could life have And the answer is quite soon, I think. Once you've got some of the heavier elements, and we have found them way back near the start of the uh, universe, uh, some of the huge stars that were there to start with threw out huge quantities of them. 
uh, and then we'd have had the reforming stars that uh, came from that. And uh, we could well um, find life starting. The um, stability is a question within the solar system in question. So that's that that's there. What whenever the the um, whenever the uh, planets form around a star. Uh, so yes, that's that's just the way it is, I suppose. But could civilization have come and gone? Yes, they certainly could. Uh, we have no idea how long ours will last either, I might say, come to that. Uh, and I think it's a, a reasonable bet that something may well have done. But given the numbers I said, the chance at this time of there being another one in the Milky Way, I think is, is very small indeed. Uh, but there may well have been uh, some others uh, previously. We don't know, of course. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, David asks a question, but I might leave his to the end. Um, Sandra, would you like to unmute and ask your question, first of all? Okay, so I was trying the space bar, but that didn't work. It's the only, I had a lot of questions to ask, but the only thing that really sticks in my mind at the moment is how likely, um, if we were to contact an um, alien civilization, how likely would the um, inhabitants look anything like us? Because we are fixated on aliens looking like, like ho ho hominid, uh, in hominid form with, four, with two arms and two legs. Yes, yes, it's, that's, that's a very interesting one, Sandra. There are people who argue, oh, they must end up looking like us because our characteristics are needed. But that's arguing backwards. This, yeah. is, this is real, really sad logic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they could look like anything at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's, it's whistling in the wind to, to take our sample of one and say it's got to be like that. I think that really is not, not likely, in my opinion. I didn't think so. Like, I, I, I have been like, I like to write science fiction, and I have a theory is that you probably would have um, civilizations that have like hominid form, and others would be like birds or octopuses, but that we would be a sort of like, it, I would call it the classic design principle. Like, we, we'd have um, people, um, creatures that look like us, but wouldn't even breed an, an atmosphere or anything like what we'd have on Earth. Well, of course, we haven't got a clue. It's, it's, no, it's I'm, I'm just saying, I'll, I'll let the next person ask them their, their question. <laughs> Hi, James. Yeah. My question is that humans have developed technology, civilization, just a few what, tens of thousands of years at most. But the dinosaurs were the dominant species for what, 160 million years? What, anyone know why they didn't evolve intelligence? It's a lovely question that, David. Um, and it's very widely discussed. And opinion is that if Chicolob didn't happen, then probably we would have intelligent dinosaurs by now. There does seem to be a premium on intelligence. Um, and so it could well have happened. Why it didn't happen sooner is a subject of a lot of arguing back and forth. Yes, they were dominant for a long time. Um, you might say, yes, we've, 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 we've come to it very quickly, but we are the end of a stream of um, really quite great length of things becoming steadily more intelligent over tens of millions of years. Uh, and so um, this, the, there is another actual angle to this whole thing that uh, I find quite interesting. Uh, <clears throat> the dinosaurs were mostly active in Pangaea, uh, which uh, was, was a supercontinent, the whole planet. 
And so the dominant species in Pangaea dominated everywhere. Uh, when it broke up into Laurasia and Gondwana land, um, then uh, things could evolve separately more easily. And so uh, evolution was put slightly on hold. Supercontinents are bad for evolution. So you need to have uh, a lot more islands, a lot more separate subcontinents, things for evolution to really get cracking. Uh, so I suspect that that is the principal reason that the dinosaurs didn't progress more quickly than they did. Great. Well, mm -hmm. I think, Laura, shall we end the questions there? Are you uh, free to hold on for a, sh a few more minutes, James? Yep. Yeah, well, I might just make a couple of quick announcements. And if anybody wants to ask any questions after that, there can be a, an informal session while the numbers wind down. So thank you very much again for it. A fascinating talk. I've never seen any, seen or read anything that detailed on life. Really put it all into context for me, tying up lots of little links. I'm going to be saving a copy of this talk for sure and coming back to you if I have any more questions. So thank you enormously, James. And do hold on, please. I have one or two Fine. other quick questions for you as well. Yep. But let me bring the formalities to a close. David, you're muted. Am I back on now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Relying too much on that space bar. The bigger event is happening in the sky because it is all in the magazine, except for the October issue isn't out yet. And the big thing in October is Venus. It's very close to the moon. We were hoping to see it near the moon this week. Clouds certainly seem to have thwarted that for most of the country, but it'll be even closer on the 9th of October. So read about that in the October magazine. That'll be out is it, uh, the, uh, next week. Should be in the post. You should arrive in your post. So everything's in the magazine. There's lots of things to see. Jupiter and Saturn are dominating the evening sky. They're just past opposition. Venus is very low. But when it's near the moon, it's actually relatively easy to see. And you can see it with the naked eye. Uh, very strong twilight. You have a good, clear western horizon. Uh, you may have read that Mercury was on view in the last few days and weeks. It isn't. Well, not from Ireland. It's not because it's too low down for us, as we said in the magazine. A lot of these internet things you read are, are based in, are, are written for the US, which is much further south than us, especially the southern states. Uh, so we won't get a good view of uh, Mercury until I think it's the end of October uh, in morning skies, if you like getting up at dawn. If not, wait till spring, you'll see the evening skies again. That'll be in the magazine. The big story is the International Space Station starts flying over every evening on this Thursday. Now, it'll be low down to begin with, but it's going to be visible for over two weeks. So it'll get higher and higher and be some spectacular passes. There's bound to be some resupply craft going up and down to give us those space chases. And the moon's in the sky first quarter tonight. So it may pass in front of the moon as well. And we'll tell you exactly where you need to be. So watch our social media for that. But the big event is that happening excuse me, <coughs> this week, at the end of this week, when, first of all, uh, Saturn is near the moon on the 16th of September. You've got your magazine. Uh, diagram here showing it and the next diagram to its right is that Jupiter is near the moon on two different nights Friday and Saturday night so Thursday Friday Saturday is a fantastic time to see really bright things in the sky uh, and next week we have the harvest moon you'll probably hear something about that in the media it's always popular the full moon will just hover over the horizon at sunset for several nights in a row the old days used to use the extra light to uh, make the harvest in the autumn end of summer much easier the equinox happens on the 22nd of september that's wednesday week uh, that's the official start of autumn in the northern hemisphere don't let them tell you it goes by the calendar months they're just arbitrary human inventions the seasons are all based on the earth's axial tilt and the equinox marks the start of autumn in the northern hemisphere always has always will and then if you've got something else to look out on the next page of the magazine you'll see uh, Uranus is near the moon. You'll need your binoculars to see that, but it's very close. There's five moon diameters away, well within your binocular field of view. So do have a look at that. 
And then we'll have the moon passing near the Pleiades and Hyades star clusters uh, on Saturday 25th and Sunday 26th of September. So all that's in your magazine. Loads to see. I mean, new stars explode or anything like that. We'll tell you on social media and in our weekly members bulletin. So that's what to see. What's happening in the, uh, uh, happening uh, other events? Well, the, we all love following the BBC Sky at Night programme. Patrick Moore is a great friend of the society. He gave us many talks in the past. And we've had most of the other presenters on the Sky at Night give talks to us in the past also. And next Sunday on BBC Four, 10 p.m., it's actually question time. So if you think of any questions uh, for James, you can always ask the Sky at Night as well on, the, on Sunday. And that'll be repeated, I'm sure, next Wednesday or Thursday next week. We'll tell you that in the members' email and on our social media. The Starbecue is the big event. It's happening October the 9th. Uh, we actually have slight problems with numbers uh, that were restricted still on October 9th. We don't quite know what to do with that, so we're having a good think about it. If you've got tickets, uh, just let us know uh, if you would mind it being postponed again till after all restrictions are gone on October 22nd. Uh, that means we could have a huge crowd. At the moment, I think we're already at capacity. We've sold all the tickets we can possibly sell. In a nightmare. We're pulling our hair out, trying to figure out what to do. We're currently it's set to go ahead on October the 9th. See astronomy.ie for details. Even classes, if you haven't booked them, do so now. Uh, they take place on October the 12th. That's a Tuesday evening, but you can watch them later on via Zoom. Uh, it's nice to watch them live, though. You can always ask questions then. And the next talk, just to close things, is a special speaker from NASA who's going to talk about the Perseverance rover, the mission to Mars. So we're really excited about that one. It's on Monday, the 11th of October, usually the second Monday of the month, 7 p.m. here on Zoom. So book online, go to astronomy.ie and sign up now. And don't forget to keep following us on uh, Facebook, Twitter and uh, Instagram, all of our social media for those ISS times and anything else like the Aurora that might happen that we can't predict at this point. And if you don't already get our magazine, do join Astronomy Ireland. We're just members of the public like you. We'd love to have you on board and we can fill you in with loads of great stories every month through the pages of Astronomy Ireland magazine. So that brings the formalities to a close. We're going to keep recording because I'm going to ask James a few more questions, but if you have to go off, we'll see you again. If not, the Starbecue, the next lecture or the evening classes some stage in October anyway. So a huge thank you again James for his excellent talk, extremely authoritative, uh, and thank you all for attending. Right, that's the formalities over. Um, can I abuse my position by asking James the first question? Uh, the Miller experiment, that, that was done in the 50s, wasn't it? 50s or 60s? Yes, it was in yeah. the 50s. And How long did it run for? Uh, was it days, weeks, or months, or years? Oh, uh, it, it, it ran for about a week, and it's actually been yeah. fairly roundly criticised for having the wrong mixture and pressure of gases in the flask, and that right. uh, there should have been a lot more concentration and pressure of carbon dioxide that would have suppressed most of the reactions they saw happen. So it's like everything. There's a lot of argument, but it's been reinstated a bit more recently where people have said, well, actually, if you think of it running for millions of years, perhaps it's not so bad. But uh, after all, all it's done is to show that you can make organic molecules rather easily. And we know that from giant molecular clouds. The trick is, how do you get them concentrated? Yeah, you were saying the, uh, not, not black smokers, it was the alkaline vents, wasn't it? Yeah. The best yeah. Uh, but somebody must have repeated that experiment then with the best oh, gas yeah. atmosphere to date. They still yeah. produce amino acids and as yes, I, we, I did it at school. <laughs> <laughs> And there we are. Has anybody le left it running for years or even decades to see? Yeah, uh, that's right. Well, I won't say bugs crawl out of it, but it, that it assembles into even more complex molecules or does it stop at amino acids? In five minutes, I had some amino acids. Five minutes? Yes, like that. Uh, has anyone left it running, though, for years and got anything more complex than that? I, do, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe so, but I don't know. <laughs> If anybody else wants to ask any questions, I see we've still got uh, still 21 people watching us. Yeah. yeah. Hi, James. Can I ask one? 
Go ahead, Larry. I'm going to shut off my video to save the bandwidth. It's uh, Larry Quigley here. Yeah, now I was just wondering if there was a, um, a civilization nearby, you know, could they detect us and how far away would they be able to detect us? Like, I'm a bit deaf, I'm afraid. How far would they? You know, say, say if uh, another civilization similar to uh, humanity was was close by, like, could they detect us, our radio waves, our television signals? and? Yeah. Uh, the, the feeling is that 200 light years is about an absolute limit, but before it all gets distorted by random magnetic fields and this and that in the galaxy. So they've got to be pretty, you've got to be pretty close to be able to pick up the direct um, uh, radio sort of activity. Okay, thank you. Um, James, Tom here. I'm just wondering, why, why do we think that there was only one instance of life started on Earth? Could, could there not have been several? Good question, Tom. Um, as I said, in connection with Luca, that the membranes on archaea are completely different from the ones on bacteria, and that's really suspicious about whether or not there was one origin. And the, the main reason for thinking one origin thoughts is that we all share the same um, DNA details, basically, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot yes. of mechanisms that, that go with that. Um, that doesn't make it so, but uh, so it's... A, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to agree with you that uh, if DNA comes quite close, uh, which it does, now that you mention it, it makes sense that there would have been only one generation yeah. of life. Yeah. Thanks, Mel. I might jump in again, but if anybody else wants to interrupt me, please do. Um, I'm, when you're asked about this question, especially by the media, I tend to say that I think most scientists believe that simple life is almost a certainty whether it evolves into intelligent life is another thing. Are you aware of any actual studies that have been done of scientists that anywhere as to how many believe, shall we say, not a really scientific term, that life, simple life, would get started elsewhere in the universe? It's an interesting question. Yeah, uh, uh, there's a very interesting question. And one of the problems is that when people say, do you think there's life out there, people, it's usually interpreted as meaning life like us, complex life. Yeah. Uh, and if you're going to be very specific about what you mean by life, I think the answer is no. Um, you know, mm -hmm. as polls have been made of how many people believe there's life out there, but no one's defined what they mean by life when they do that. So it's a pretty much a waste of time, I think. Maybe another way of saying it would be, are you aware of any studies that have asked scientists, it'd be great to go to a meeting of, say, the American Astronomical Society and poll them and say, yeah. you don't believe that simple life will yeah. evolve in the right circumstances. Well, there you are. There's a little little uh, uh, task for you, David. I know. I, I've been in touch with their press officer quite a bit. I must drop them an email. <laughs> they meet <laughs> twice a year. <laughs> and let me know the answer. <laughs> The, well, does anybody else want to ask a question? I'll pause for about five seconds and I'll jump in with another one. There is one there on chat. Uh, oh, there is, yeah. Give me a boot um, a, a quick mention, explanation of the Fermi paradox. Perhaps I went over that oh, yes. too quickly. Basically, um, what Fermi is saying is if you've got an adequately technologically competent species, um, its ability, maybe even with traveling at much less than light velocity, in a few million years, you can, you can cover the whole galaxy. Uh, and if you're a species of that persuasion, they should be here. And they haven't appeared here and shown themselves. So that seems strange. Either in the flesh, as it were, or as um, robotic type probes or whatever. And we've seen no evidence for anything at all. So that's a bit, um, 
that's a, that's it, it, in, in a small way, that's pointing to the idea that there may well not be anything out there. I just see Edward Malarkey asks, can you say a quick word about SETI? Yeah, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, it all started Project Osmar in the, the 60s with our friend Drake again, and um, looking for particular wavelengths between um, uh, neutral hydrogen and, 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 and hydroxyl around uh, 18 to uh, 21 centimeter wavelengths because the there's not much happens in those wavelengths. And they say, well, that's one you'd use because the air or the, the galaxy is pretty clear. Well, people have moved away from that now because they'll say that that's not how they would do it probably. Um, the trouble is, as our technology improves, uh, we're, we keep thinking of other ways that, that an intelligent species would communicate. And um, all we all we can do is 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 listen out with sort of what what equipment we do have that could could listen out for things and that's changed a bit over the years um it's all hitherto been electromagnetic stuff but the wavelengths have changed quite a lot and quite a lot of money has been put into it a lot of people would like i suppose to find something is the answer and so it's supported and although i don't believe they will personally find anything uh, I do think it's a search we should undertake because I too, like everybody else, am thick as shit and I probably haven't understood the whole subject at all. And so you have to look because that's how you find things out. If somebody else a chance. Here we go. Somebody else there? Oh, good. Then I can ask another one. <laughs> um, these two bugs that may have eaten each other, I, I don't understand, one's eukarya, is it? Um, the other one, uh, can you explain more about those? Because I'm not a biologist, I don't know much about this subject. What, what are they? Are they special types of bacteria? Yeah, prokaryotes are the simple single-celled organisms. They have genetic material in them, but they don't really have much in the way of internal structure. You might say primitive bacteria and archaea are just that. Uh, and of course, they're they're everywhere. Uh, eukarya or eukaryotes are complex organisms. If you look at their cells, they have a nucleus. They have all sorts of structures in the cell. They have something like a thousand times as much DNA as the simple cells, um, and so they are qualitatively quite different. I mentioned in particular. Um, the mitochondria, but another example in plants is the, the chloroplasts and so on and so forth. So they have uh, all sorts of organelles, all sorts of structural things happening inside the cells that make them infinitely more capable. And that's why we can build everything from an amoeba to, uh, to a human, if you like, out of the same basic building blocks, because they have such complex cellular structures um, and, and the ability to hold so much information and the ability to turn energy into use uh, per gene or whatever enormously powerfully that they can actually make um, very different uh, forms of life from the simple cells which really have a, a small amount of unstructured uh, DNA. But that I think is probably it in a nutshell, really. Which one absorbed? Which one absorbed? Which one though? Sorry. Did, did one absorb the other, or are you carrier uh, the, the the merged organism? An archaean absorbed a bacterium to make uh, the the, the uh, uh, mitochondria. Right. I've heard it said that that uh, you mentioned it yourself that. That was an extremely rare process and probably only has happened once in the history of the universe. And even statistically, it shouldn't have happened 14 billion years after the Big Bang. It's way too early. We were just a fluke and that could explain why we're alone. Is that roughly right? Uh, 
Well, we're guessing, aren't we? But yeah. the fact that we're all descended from one particular event where the mitochondrion was absorbed into the archaea, uh, it smells fishy. In biology, anything or any biochemical thing that can happen in simple bacteria and archaea will have happened. Um, and if this thing has, uh, if this thing has only happened once, I say unless we ate the others, um, then that has to be an extraordinary thing, really extraordinary. Right, well, I saw Seamus Bonner joining us there. And if Seamus wants to ask a question, that might be the end of all the questions for this evening. We've been going on two hours now. Are you okay, Seamus? Yes, I'm grand, yes. Sorry, I'm a bit late coming in. Yeah. No problem. You can watch the recording. You're in for a treat. Yeah. <laughs> well, unless there's any more questions there, I think we can leave it at that. 17 people are enjoying us talking about it. Uh, but we have been on for two hours and uh, all I can do is just thank you again enormously, James. Uh, terrific talk. It's answered a lot of my questions and if I have any more, I'll be in touch. Okay. A, a great pleasure. And please do. Thank, thank you. you very thank you. much indeed. Okay. Right. I'm going to end the meeting now and a few, oh, we have a few thank yous coming in. Yeah. No more questions though. So we'll end the meeting there. Thanks to Laura and on you still watching in as well for running the event. We'll see you all next month. Thank James. you. Bye bye. Bye.